Hey everybody, Mark Agnesi here for Gibson TV. And today, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, outside the home of my friend and boss, Cesar Goikian. Now, Cesar has been an avid guitar collector for years. That collection has grown exponentially. Now, we've looked at a lot of rock star collections on this show, but today, what you're about to see may shock you. This is the collection with Cesar Goikian. What's up, Mark? Dude, what's How you up? How man? How you been, man? Welcome back. Oh, thank you for having us over today. Yeah. I'm ready to, uh, ready to look at some guitars. You've got some new stuff. Some things new, some things old. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah, this is gonna be great. What is, when did that get here? That's, uh, that's also been a recent acquisition. We, uh, Tell me a little bit about this thing. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, piano from 1928, so the wood has been making music since 1928. So the original in, shell. Yeah. The shell. That's, that's it. And then inside is a brand new piano. So this shell went back to Steinway and then they built a new piano preserving the wood, preserving the shell. Again, you know, in the, I love that story, you know, the that's history awesome. of yeah. it and the fact that it's been amazing, making music for so many decades. So. It was the one when we tried it and we we saw it and you you know you hear the story of it that it's from 28 yeah. you kind of fall in love with the whole story and then you hear it and that's it it's magical wow wow we haven't even gotten to the guitars no. yet man what a way to start the day we let's heading go. up we heading upstairs let's go see some guitars all right let's do it so where does this whole guitar journey begin for you well I grew up around a guitar. It was in the had, house. It was in the house. My dad played this classical Spanish guitar, and so it was always around. He played a couple of chords and, and also played a lot of his record collection constantly, so music was always in the house. And he would play Tom Petty and a little bit of the Beatles and the Stones, maybe a little Led Zeppelin. And, but he had this big record collection, and I was always intrigued by what he wasn't playing. And a lot of Led Zeppelin in there, most of the records, all the Pink Floyd stuff. And then there was this record, which was Black Sabbath's first. Black, Black, Sabbath, Black, Sabbath, Black yeah. Sabbath, which was still wrapped in the film. And I looked at that cover and I was like, well, okay, this is eerie, cool. I need to, what is this? So I put it on, I opened it up, put it on. And I was really into looking at the labels and looking at the drawings and and that record being called Black Sabbath and then having on the label the song made me want to go there. I know it's played with a guitar. I have a guitar at home. How do I put it together? So that's the most, I, say, I would say, dramatic to memory experience of me saying, okay, music, it's recorded and played with a guitar. I have a guitar, let's go. Yeah. You remember like buying your first Gibson guitar? I do. The first Gibson came later because for the first almost two and a half to three years, I was now learning how to play with that Spanish guitar. And so I learned more sort of classical style, still trying to get those sounds out. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't working, but I do remember going to the store. So I was in Miami. I was playing tennis. I played tennis uh, competitively growing up and I made 700 bucks playing a tournament in Miami and immediately grabbed that money and I went to the, the guitar, guitar store. store. Yeah. And I went in and I said, I want that black standard, Gibson Les Paul standard yeah. ebony. I want that guitar. And I couldn't afford it. I remember maybe it was like 13, a little, a little over 1300 and I, I had 700 bucks. But this is my mind now starts, started to kick in and I live in Argentina, there's currency controls. Every, everything there in terms of instruments is, was at the time around double the price. Yeah. So I bought a $700 guitar. I took it down there. 30 days later, I sold it for 1400, maybe a little more. And then two months later, I came back and it was pretty nerve wracking because you never know, is that guitar gonna Gone still be there? Yeah. But I went to the same store, I went there, the guitar was still there and I bought my first Gibson. Oh man, we got a lot of stuff to look at today. I guess we'll start with this one here. Anything before we open the case? This one is 
special for many reasons. One is because this is the guitar that my wife got me for my 40th. I know and, what this is. I know what this is, yeah. And the second reason why it's special is because it's the first guitar that I bought from you. This is how we met. This is how we met. All right, let's crack it open. Oh, yeah. Cherry red. Refresh my memory here. So 1964, 335, TDC, block inlay, 59 neck. Remember, that's the back thing. in 1964. Yeah. And it's not that far in terms of serials from Clapton. Clapton's Crossroads. Yeah. So this is it. That's the, th that's the uh, 64 335, first one I bought from you. And you saw it on Guitar of the Day. Yeah, I actually was watching your Guitar of the Days for a while before yeah. that. And then when you, when you finally you, were, you popped this one, and you were, I remember, if I remember correctly on that video, you were like, boom, this is the, the clapping guitar. guitar. Yeah. So I called you immediately and we were like, that's mine. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong. We took scans of this yep. guitar when we started to do the new historic yep. custom shop ESs. This is the model through the scans and creating the digital image, the 3D image, for the custom shop historic collection 64. The 64. Do you have one of those? That's the one. And? Of course you do. Most importantly, the reason why I have it is because I wanted a replica so that if I, you know, anybody wants to use it, any one of our artists wants to use a 64, I always have a custom shop yeah. 64 that they can use. And then if I want to take one out, now this one can stay here and I can yeah. take this one out. Yeah. So this is number one of the 64 Reissues. historic collection. Yeah. So you can justify owning some of this stuff. Yeah, nice. So all the contours on the top, the neck profile, yeah. everything for that guitar and everyone after it all came. Anyone that has a custom shop, new historic collection, 1964 335 is modeled after mine. He's a clone of this. Rad. All right, we got a pair, a Cali Girl. Oh, a Cali Girl case. It, it just happened to be that when I got this guitar, I got the case, and it's a Cali Girl case. Obviously, it doesn't belong to this guitar. This was supposed to be with a burst. Yeah, significantly earlier than what's in there. Well, let's do a little dual crackage, shall we? Oh, yeah. Oh. So, what is this? So 61, 61 Les Paul, SG Junior. So yes, clearly a cherry in the past. You can see the cherry underneath. Some tan lines underneath. Yeah, the when guard. I pulled when I pulled the guard out, it's all cherry underneath, but it's fully tanned. As you can yeah. see, it's browned out. A little bit more cherry on the back. But yeah, as you know, and you've you've um, known for many many years in 19. 61, the Les Paul goes to the shape. Goes to the SG body. What is then this? Then let's get to this. This has got a story. So let me give it to you. And this guitar is the one that shouldn't exist. It's a 1962, clearly a Les Paul double cut. Yeah. Special. But it shouldn't really exist because in 1962, the Les Paul, is that the was SG that guitar body. we yeah. were making. And as you can see, normally it would say Les Paul special. Mm -hmm. doesn't say anything because the name was taken. So I actually looked it up on the ledger and it's listed. There's like a batch of six of them, serial numbers back to back. And they say SG special. And that's the first time that I've seen in the ledger that we use the SG name for solid guitar. Yeah. So since the Les Paul name was taken, it says SG special. It doesn't say Les Paul on the headstock. I think that's the birth of the name of the SG. I'm not, I haven't been able to find it earlier. And then we apply it to the SG in 1964. Isn't it nice to just have access to the ledgers and just go in and look stuff up? I am always, every time <laughs> I see a guitar that I want to buy, the first thing I do is I go to the ledger, I look it up, make sure it's all good. Yeah. You know, Matt Kaler and Jason Davidson and you and yeah. I are always on that four-way mm -hmm. text. Every time I find something, I send it to you guys and then we yeah. look it up. A pair of brown cases. Pair of brown cases. Could be anything in here. Yeah. You want to pop them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh. T oh, a TV yellow party. I love a TV yellow party. 
Single and double, 57. I sold you... This one. This one? Yeah, I remember this too. So yeah, this is, yeah, 57, single cut, 59. Look at how different yep. the color varies on the TV yellow. One, you know, some go mustard, some go, you know, banana. preserve the banana. Yeah. yeah. They're cool. The checking's cool. I like how the the checking goes into all the little dings. It yeah. finds, finds its way there. Right? Great. P90s versus humbuckers. Do you have a preference or do you just got to have both? Well, yeah, exactly. It's, yeah. You got to have both. I mean, it's, there are such, such cool, vibey and different sounds. The humbucker, obviously, is a humbucker. And the, but to me, the P90 is, is incredibly special. It just sounds amazing. Yeah. Do you prefer the double cut to the single cut? No. Or is there, you reach for one in any sort of circumstance? I, I, it's completely a random selection based on whatever I'm feeling that day and what I want to play. Yeah. 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 No, it's right. And I, and I love this neck profile. Yeah. On both, by the way. Let me hear, can we trade really quick? Love these necks. I mean, when you I mean, think 59 Les Paul, most people wouldn't think. They would think it's bigger than this. Yeah, no, and it, and it isn't. That's it, the neck. Yeah, people think these, that these are these huge, clubby no. baseball bat necks, and they're really not. They're very comfortable and just nice and, and full, yep. but not huge. That's yeah, great. They only got really bigger in 58 and then back down in 59 to yep. this profile. Which is just perfect. Yeah. Man, that feels great. That one feels great, And too. it's got great frets. Yeah, so, well, big frets by this era, so. This one, this one I need to refret. What, tell me your stance on that. Because oh, obviously uh, as vintage guitars, you start changing stuff, they start losing their value. Where do you stand on refrets? Refretting everything. Refret everything is my... I am Don't be afraid everything. to refret your guitars if they need to be refretted. I play my guitars. Yeah. And, and I can't play them unless if, you know, the frets are gone, you have to refret them. Yeah. So I take them to Joe Glazer and they get refretted. <laughs> yeah. And, he, you know, the amazing job. And then they become the best guitars Tools that you again. could ever yeah. play. Yeah. More than just an object. Oh, I'm 100% refret yeah. everything you want to play. Don't be shy about refretting your guitars. It's like changing the oil. Yeah. If, yeah. if, if you put too many miles on it, you got to change the oil. You wear through the frets. You got to change the frets. And these old 50s guitars didn't have huge frets on them to begin with. Right. So when you figure they're 60 plus years old, yeah. it's basic maintenance on a fret job. Just yeah. take it to somebody who knows what they're doing. Yeah. When did the guitar collecting start happening? As I started working and, and making a little bit of money, then I started buying guitars. And, and maybe it was now, I would say, in my late, mid to late 20s, where I started buying, okay, I had, I had my Les Paul Custom, but then I bought my second guitar, and then I started buying other guitars. And it was more as, as I developed in my professional career and started earning income, and that led to having the ability to buy. And then that took me into this rabbit hole of every time I bought a guitar, you know, you would open it up and see, okay, what's exactly. inside? How is this built? Why, what kind of woods are in there? What's the body? What's the top? Why are the tone woods used on the fretboard? Why will a tuner make it sound different? And that led to, I don't know, 130 <laughs> guitars later. Yeah. What were you going for initially when you started collecting? Were you going after vintage stuff? Were you going after just putting together a collection of different things or what were you chasing? Yeah, no, I wasn't, at the time it wasn't about vintage, it was about, okay, Tony's playing an SG, so I need to buy an SG. And Slash is playing a Burst, so I want a Burst. And Jerry Gondrell is playing a Les Paul Custom that looks different, it looked red, okay, I want one of those. And then Hetfield is playing an Explorer, what is that? I need one of those. And yeah. Dave Mustaine is playing these and I want a V. And it was more about which artists I was listening to yeah. and that I was into and watching what they were playing and then acquiring that. When did you finally get bit by the, the vintage guitar bug? That came later. I mean, because as you know, because you, I was your yeah. client, it, it's vintage guitars are, are very valuable. So that came a little later. So in my mid thirties was probably when I started buying the first more collectible vintage guitars. And, um, and then from there, you know, it, you buy the first one and maybe it's, 
it's a special or a junior and then you no. go at least Gibson's and then you go into all right that's great and then I want something else and then I want something else and then or maybe opportunistically something comes up and you buy it so that's how it developed and it's really been vintage for me it's really been the last 10 years yeah all right we got another pair of brown cases we've worked up juniors and specials I think we're starting to maybe get into the good stuff we this is this is where it where it starts changing as you know because right in we go now into 56 with the gold tops and now we've got the two pneumatic bridge we're getting to burst dna here all right oh, oh that's crusty Fiby, right oh i love a crusty gold top okay so this is the very near predecessors of Burst here. You have right. a 56 gold top, and then here's a first year standard 57 gold top that is just crusty. Yeah. I mean, oh, that's <laughs> as vibey as they come, right? I mean, that's just the way I like them. Oh, it's all green and checking's all deep. Look at that neck. Somebody definitely was married. Or yeah. wearing lots of rings. <laughs> rings. Yeah. Oh, man. Killer. Where'd you get this one? Uh, this one actually came from uh, Drew, Drew Berlin. Berlin. Yeah. And uh, I was looking for a 56 gold top, as you say, it's the, the beginning of the burst DNA. And, and this guitar in particular sounds so good. I don't know what happened here internally with these P90s and the way that this guitar is aged, but it's got it's got some emotional thing that's wanting to put out that puts the sound that's out of this world. Yeah. And this one, I, I remember this yeah, one. Yeah, you know that where we got that this one. This yeah. one came from Albert mm -hmm. Molinaro, also Molinaro. in Los Angeles. And yeah, that, that's about as vibey. And he sent us, remember the pictures of, or he sent me the pictures of two different ones. And one was a little too clean. Yeah. And we were like, no, this is, this is the way I want it. Mint guitars are fun, but we'll see. I'm, I'm we'll, mint. There's mint stuff here too, but I, I'm a bigger fan of a beet gold top than yeah. a mint gold top because they just look so good. That green killer. Of course, we got PAFs here. Just two different takes on basically the exact same guitar, but just worlds apart in terms of tone and what they do. But and what you can tell here also, and I don't know if it comes through on camera, which is. What our guys were doing back in the 50s, somebody, somebody sanding this down went a little too far. Yeah, so it's got the that race track yeah. around it, whereas yeah. this one's a little more subtle. Yeah. And it's just every 50s and 60s guitar is different just yeah. because there they was no consistency. Each have a fingerprint. Man. Yeah, and so that's so amazing. Wow. That's, where do you go from here? Well, <laughs> let's see. I know where we go from here. How important is it to you in your current role to own these examples from the golden era? Incredibly important. I think it gives me uh, an appreciation of the heritage, the history, particularly the golden era led by Ted McCarty and his team. And the fact that I went on that journey of trying to acquire instruments made during that era and it may be even before that when I started wanting different Gibsons and then wanting to get Gibsons from the golden era. I started reading a lot about what they were doing back then. And so I had this incredible appreciation of what they did back then and how that influenced music across so many genres of music. Before coming into the role, having had the opportunity to own so many Gibsons, it almost makes me feel like a custodian of the brand. You know, I started earlier, I started with my journey of an obsession to get more Gibsons because I wanted the different sounds and I, and then I wanted to be collecting guitars and I wanted more. Yeah. And, and now in this position of, you know, influence in writing the next chapter, I think, uh, I, I feel even more interested in buying more and discovering more and what's out there that, I, ha I haven't been able to put my hands on. And it, it somehow, I don't know how to describe it, but mentally I feel that increases 
the level of responsibility that I have now as a steward of yeah. Gibson in the future. And we are temporary here, right? We're temporary custodians and stewards of Gibson. It should be bigger than all of us. This is a brand that has 127 years of history and will have another 127 years of future. And so we are temporary custodians of the brand and I am maybe a temporary custodian of my collection. So I, I really think that those two things go together. We just have one solitary brown case now. There could only be one thing in here. And it's not a Blackguard Telly. And it's, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what do we got? Yikes. Dude, that's clean. This is a clean 59 burst. I mean, it's got a little fade on it, but that's, that is, dude, it's barely checked. Barely, well, yeah, barely checked, barely anything. Look at the, look at the. Little fade in here, yeah. but yeah. Wow. Oh, we got some nice, nice kind of center seam mm -hmm. flame happening. There's a bit of a flame going all the way up here. Right through the seam, yeah. Oh boy. And the interesting story is that it's, it's a sister, a few serial numbers from something else we're gonna see. So this is what, 90418. And we're gonna see- For uh, those of you keeping track at home, remember that serial number, 90418. Yeah. Man, how many do you think you've had the chance played? to play? I probably pay, played 20, 25. Yeah something like that and uh and they're all different they all, all have you kind of some... fall in love with every single one you play yeah there's just an aura about these guitars that when you pick it up it just changes everything about everything that you i do. haven't had an experience where i said i didn't like the sound of a burst but maybe, they all do sound yeah a maybe because i got a, the, the ones that i got a chance to play were already owned by friends of mine that are collectors that they've already gone through a selection process and so maybe that's the case but they they all sound a little different and they all have something that distinguishes them and this guitar is actually the the birthday burst because and i got this one from drew as well this came from Drew. he played this guitar at the celebration of les paul's a hundredth birthday yeah. at BB King's in New York. And, and then one of his clients bought it, who is the person that then told brought Drew to sell it. So I brought it, I bought it from there. But so that's why this one is the birthday first because it was used, it was played by Drew. Now, I mean, in comparison, how good are the ones that we're making right now at custom? Because I've probably played 40 bursts and I'll take one from the custom shop any day of the week. Man. Yes. They're great guitars. Yeah. But what we're doing right now is. I think it we're making the closest it's clones, clones that we Gibson in our history and in the history of the custom shop uh, have ever made. We have the luxury of having the two guys that started the R9 project. Yeah. Keith Medley and, and Tom Murphy. Murph, yeah. They did the first R9 in 93, and they're still with us. They're still our engineers and luthiers. Keith is our luthier at Gibson USA and helping the custom shop. Tom is the luthier and the curator and master artisan of the Murphy Lab. So I do believe that today, if you, want, if you buy a custom shop 59, you're getting the closest that we've ever been some might say it sounds better. Some might say it's different. Some might say the originals, these sound better. That's a matter of opinion. But then again, like we're talking, every one of these sounds mm -hmm. different. different. So it's like, what are you comparing it against? But And the scans we have of 59 bursts originals, I mean, I think we have probably over 30 now since in, in the, the last catalog, three years. Yeah. And then we have to create a bit of a, an average of everything to for the R9 that we have out, because as you say, they are a little, a little different. Yeah, and you hear people talk about, oh, we don't get the top carve right. Or we don't. The They're top carve is coming from scans of original. They're all different. There's a database of, I want to say over 60 scans, 30, 30 of which are recent. And that's what we use to do the 59s. Yeah. 
So, because every single one, if we show, if we were to show a 3D scan, they're all different. Yeah, some have a big lip yeah. and a big, you know, skate deck around the outside. Mm -hmm. Some are very, very flattened off. Exactly. It's, a, it's it, they're not all the same. And they don't all sound the same. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know, man, I just got one of the Murphy Lab 59s and just yeah. blown away yeah. by everything about it. The binding roll, the, the neck feels like it's been played for 60 years, man. That's the point, it's, a, it's the blindfold test, right? It's gotta feel right. Yeah, it's not about looking old, it's about feeling old. So yeah, yeah the holy grail. But man, that's, that's as nice as they get right there. There it is. Killer. What do you know about Gibson as a brand? They make the guitars in a different way that everyone will like them. Yeah. Now you've been to the factory before, right? Yes. Yeah, What's it like watching men and women actually make these things by hand? It's cool. Um, I like it. It's really, we saw when they were spraying them, it was really cool. When they were putting the finish on them? Yes. You got to watch them do a sunburst? Yeah. It's pretty cool stuff watching them get to do it, isn't it? Got black cases this time. I normally know what's in those. We've already looked at the standards, the gold top, the burst. Oh man. With or without wiggle stick is the question. <laughs> How do you like your Les Paul custom? I don't have to do that. I don't have to make that decision. <laughs> the choice does not have to be made today. No. Oh, what do we got here? Okay. I got a 58 Black Beauty with uh, wiggle stick. What's that one there? 59. 59 with the stop tail. Both. Six PAFs. Six PAFs, two guitars and six PAFs. That's the way to do it. Both of these have been refretted. Yes. Thank God. Yes. Because fretless wonder frets. No, I cannot. I, I can't get around I, I love and I wish I had had the opportunity to, to meet Les Paul himself. What are you thinking? Well, he was thinking the question. He was thinking I'm playing 13 gauge flat wounds yeah. and I'm not bending strings. But Correct. We're bending strings we're, and we're not doing... playing flat wounds. So no. we'll no, take no. big frets. Frets. We need frets. And this, uh, in this one I put, um, I believe these are 43s, the frets. So they're still narrow, but they're a little bit taller than... So they're, well, I mean, the, the fretless wonders weren't even hitting 20. Yeah. So these are 43s. This those has got bigger. like those burst are, frets on. Those are yeah. burst frets. Yeah, I put burst frets. There. I see you got the middle pickup kind of ducked down on both of these. Is yeah. that, do you use the in the middle sound or is it just kind of, you got to keep it out of your way? Well, it still works in the middle sound really well. And it actually has a little bit more of that out of phase by, by taking ducking it down. down a bit. But that's not the reason why I do it. I do it because I'm so used to playing double humbuckers that I actually hit it otherwise with my pick. Yeah and it's really hard for me to play it. But when it's like this, I got no problem, I can play them, and middle position, accentuated, uh, out of phase situation. Yeah. They're just like the coolest. This is like one of those guitars, like you could be wearing a tuxedo and playing at a country club, and like a black Les Paul Custom is the perfect guitar for you, and on the same hand, you could have like a mohawk and like a leather jacket on and a, punk, oh. and like, and a black Les Paul Custom is the perfect guitar for you. It like, yeah. it transcends yeah. all genres. It transcends tre like trends. That's, yeah. that's about as sexy. And everybody's played them from, from Les, Les Paul, Paul to James Hetfield and anybody in it's, between. So it's- That's a classic, man. There, it, there's something special about them. And then remember when we talked about the serial number of the burst? Yeah. Well, look at this one. 90451. That was what, 90418? So we're like 33. less than 33 serial numbers away from the burst. So these, these are definitely sisters, but they were hanging for sure in the, the factory, day. probably yeah. the same Came day. Came off the line on the same yeah. day. Unbelievable. And look at that checking. Yeah, yeah. they just look great. Well, and these guitars, by the way, have all gone to the Murphy Lab. To Every single analyzed. one of the guitars, yeah. they go to Tom and they all they all keep learning and keep cataloging and photographing. And every time we get our hands on any or any guitar made in the 50s and the 60s by an artist, a collector, we ask, we scan, we take them to the lab, they photograph yeah. everything, they look at it, how does it feel? How's the checking going? What's the where pattern? Where is it? Where, mm. where are the, yeah, where are the 
typical areas. So we get to learn from them. Oh man. Yeah, you can see that. How proud are you of the guitars we're making right now? And what do you think people are gonna think a hundred years from now when they look back on this current era of Gibson? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I couldn't be more proud of our teams and of, of what we've been able to create in the last almost three years and changing what guitars we are making, how are they made, organizing the team so that we have a, a team of wood scientists that are out there looking for the best of the best of the woods out there and working with sustainable farmers and having this, this obsession to search for the best tone woods and, and looking at how we were making instruments back in the 50s and the 60s, getting inspired by that and building the original collection, building the custom shop historic collection of clones. And a lot of the things that we're gonna see today are going to, are, were part of that journey. You know, they came to the custom shop, we scanned, we got collections from other musicians and collectors, and we went through the process of uh, scanning instruments so that we could achieve that level of uh, authenticity and, and clone status yeah. in the historic collection. And it was a lot of work. It was, at the very beginning, I was basically stationed in our factories, working with our teams, uh, making sure that every step of the process we were getting the, the results we were looking for and now we have that we have that that sort of organization around an original collection of our good representation of the golden era of those greatest hits we have a modern collection where we can explore a little bit and then in the custom shop we have the historic collection and then we have the modern collection across electrics and acoustics and you and I talked a lot about this initially because you were one of the first ones to join yeah. this journey and, and looking at what were the guitars and how we were going to make them and what was going to go into it. And if you remember, then we, on, on the whiteboard, we designed the acoustic yep. original and custom shop historic. I you sat in a hotel room one night on a, on a bar napkin and came back the next day and yeah, we make a 50s Les Paul and a 60s Les Paul. We should make a 50s J45 and a 60s J45. Exactly. You know, all those kinds of things. Coffin case with your name on it. Yeah. I'm assuming this is something custom. It's a very special, very special guitar for me because this guitar was built by my only guitar professor and teacher yeah. that I had from age, I'd say 11 to about 15. He was a luthier. He taught me how to play. Then he moved to Spain and made guitars for all the famous Spanish guitarists oh, wow. forever, for decades. I lost track of him. And then he moved to Germany and moved his atelier there. I started making guitars in Germany. And then I found him through social media. We connected. And so we said, and his name is Willy Burgos. And so I said, Willy, let's, I always had this dream of making the Spanish guitar with you because that's how you taught me how to play with the Spanish guitar that I had at home. So we basically embarked on this journey and it took about a year and a half to complete because every single piece he made done by one other guy. than the tuners. Yeah. And he made every single thing by hand. The top is a German spruce that he's been aging and he's had, he's been saving in his workshop for 25 years. And then you'll see the, the detail of this guitar. Oh, wow. Yeah. And he made the case. Made the coffin case as well. Yeah. And, and so this is to me almost like full circle. Yeah. Because it's, it's definitely different from the Spanish guitar that I learned with, but I think it might be the only 24 fret Spanish <laughs> guitar. <laughs> you had to do a 24 fret. I had to go there. I said, Willie, the one thing we have to do is it's gotta be 24 frets. And it's gotta have the cutaway so that I can get down, uh, you know, up on the high frets. And I mean, it's just the most beautiful thing. It was a, uh, just a, just unbelievable. That's cool. What's Look the, at the back? back? Ebony, uh, ebony back, ebony sides, German spruce, ebony here. Wow, in this inlay. Yep, Pretty mother cool. of pearl. This is 
this detail. Uh, we, he had me write my last name, sent it to him, and then he did that in Argentine bronze. Oh, so that's a bronze yeah, inlay. It's inlaid with Argentine bronze. Wow. And then the neck here has um, brown wood, ebony in the middle. I don't remember what that is. But it's, it's a spectacular guitar, and not only it is spectacular, it's emotional for me yeah. because it's where everything started with him as my teacher yeah. and then him building me this guitar. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Is this one kept somewhere special in the house? It stays in here where I have this room always constantly Controlled, humidified. Yeah. So it's been used. Actually, Richie used it. Um, Kiko used it with Dave oh, the in the record. Yeah. And so anytime somebody comes to the house and they, they start playing it, they always want to borrow it because it, yeah. it, the sound is all there. Now be honest, have you ever used the 24th fret? No. no. <laughs> but it has to be there. It has to be there. How close are you? Obviously you're on the business side of this, you're in the office, but how close do you try to stay to the actual production process. How often do you go to the factory? I'm in the factories, you know, two to three times a week. Um, I'm always walking around there, look, working with our luthiers, you know, working with Jim DeCola and Keith Medley and Matt Kaler and Cody Higby and all the guys in the different places. And then I go to Bozeman relatively often because I think it's, it's, to me personally, it feels very important, one, just to go there. Because every time I go there, I see something. You know, I look at a headstock, I look at a back, I look at a top, I, I watch something being made that maybe I want to change or maybe might inspire me to do something different or to add something. And then it all, I also have to go there because I'm working with the teams and so they want to look at prototypes and we want to be looking at maybe processes and how can we improve something or maybe there's an, there's an investment we can make in something new for the factories. So for for my own satisfaction and to work with the teams, but also, you know, the, the business of it, I'm in the factories uh, a couple times a week. We got another ES case here, another black one. We saw the 335. Oh, yeah, I think I know what's in this one. This is gonna bring back memories. Oh yeah, Pelham Blue ES330 was a 67. Yep. I believe, wow. You remember this guitar? I think this was the last guitar that uh -huh. I ever sold you. Yeah. Which this came uh, from another customer of mine when I was at Norm's named Rich, and he did not want to get rid of it. And uh, I actually had a Pelham Blue SG of his that I had sold, and he brought this thing. He's like, I know you can sell this in a day, but make sure that whoever gets it knows what it is. So I never put it out. I stuck it in a exactly. case in the back. And you and JC walked into the store. That was the first time we ever met in person. I was like, dude, I got something to show you. And I remember it was that. This. We went to the back and you opened the case and, and I, I, so that was it. I mean, the moment I saw it, it was done. Yeah. Which this is what you want Pelham Blue to look like. Which, you know, that top coat goes yellow and then the whole thing turns green. But then you look at the back of the neck and it's like perfectly blue because all that clear coat got played through. And I don't even know what happened up here, but we'll just call it vibe. That's exactly what it is. That's what happened. And the binding, look at the binding, how yellow the binding is on it. It's just perfect, man. What I love about these guitars, well, the clean sounds with, a, with a, just a touch of yeah. just so, crunchiness. Yeah. Just, I don't know, there's something about them. So that's normally what I go with when I play it. Also, it's my go-to guitar when I don't want to plug in. The couch guitar. Yeah. Because it's perfectly loud it's enough a... to sit and accompany yourself on the couch. Yeah. But look at the back. Are you kidding me? It's, it's just guitar. like, I'm looking at it here. This is green. And then this is like shiny metallic blue. It's just that, that clear coat. This is the definition of epic. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. So cool. Rich, it went to a good home, dude. I promise. Thank you, Rich. Now, you mentioned earlier Black Sabbath and Megadeth, Alice in Chains, Metallica. You're friends now with all of these guys you grew up idolizing. And more than that, they trust you with 
their legacy and right. what is it like to look at your phone and it's slash calling or it's Tony Iommi on line one? Like, what is that like? It's, it doesn't, it, it doesn't get, I don't get used to it if that's the question. And every no. time I, every time I speak with Slash or with Tony or uh, Dave Mustaine or anyone, any one of our artists, I don't, I, I don't get desensitized. It, the fact that I'm in conversation with them, the fact that they trust me commercially and that we have that level of conversation where, you know, they're, they have this amazing, amazing creative juices flowing. And when I talk to Adam Jones, we talk, and Adam and I talk about a lot of stuff on a very regular basis. And, and I still feel this sense of massive responsibility towards them and to be just like I'm a, I'm a, I feel like I'm a steward of, and a custodian and a steward of Gibson. I feel the same way about them and their name. Yeah. And, and I try to be, I also try to be more objective in the way I think about it because I don't want to, I don't want to let my emotional connection to their music influence a decision. But, but I think it's worked well because the passion for what they do that I have, we're able to, to and, and you too, and the rest of the teams were able actually to showcase that. And it makes us, it makes us want to try harder to do right by them. And I think that was very important initially also talking to the different teams was let's make sure that we are paying tribute to the artists that made us relevant. We gotta go there. We have to be artist centric because they are the ones ultimately who made our guitars relevant and loved around yeah. the world. This looks like it's got some stories. Yeah, this is, this is vibey. <laughs> yeah, I guess it, in a word, vibey would be the one. So this is a special guitar because it's, a, it's not only a, a 1963 Hummingbird that has obviously made a lot of music, as you can see, yeah. but it's also a guitar that was gifted to me by a friend of mine um, who has become a very close friend. And it's, um, this is the first guitar when Jason Momoa started making money, he treated himself to a Gibson guitar. Yeah. This guitar, 1963 Hummingbird. And he's, he's had it ever since. And he's a great player. Yeah. He's not only a great actor and creative and, um, you know, artist at large, he's a great musician. Yeah. And so he treated himself to this guitar and one night we were having dinner here at home and, you know, we've been doing a lot with him and it, it was a bit emotional for me because he pulled this guitar out of the car and brought it to me and he said, you know, bro, you've done so much for me uh, and you and Gibson have done so much for me that I want you to have this guitar. And then he told me the story. This was the first guitar wow. that I bought for myself, like, you know, my first Gibson. Yeah. So I said, look, the, the, the only way I accept the gift is that this, like, I'm a temporary custodian of this guitar. As soon as your kids start getting good at playing, this guitar goes, goes back, back to you. Yeah. I mean, it, the, I'm seeing it's got like this whole fingerboard is inlaid, which I'm assuming this whole fingerboard was replaced because it's got like pearl binding on it mm -hmm. as well. It's got and the pearl binding brass inlay. It's got a brass, brass nut. nut that was done before Jason bought it. Oh, this is how he got it? How he got it. It had a pickup and it was wired out there. Yeah. So I, I took that out and I had a repair and restoration shop guys fix that. Yeah. And Adjustable saddle was swapped out for a fixed bridge. So I, I had them swap that yeah. out as well because it was an unstable saddle. And, and now, I mean, this is just like an insanely amazing guitar. It sounds incredible. Yeah. It looks incredible. No, it just... And there's another 63. Let's go look at that. This one I got, I got a call from Elliot at Rumble Seed yeah. and said, I got this guitar with the original case. And he said, it's, it's unique because it's a humming dove. Oh, love these. Only in 63. Yep, there's the maple back. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, so hummingbird appointments on the front, dove, 
appointments on the back. You can see the maple. Yep. So like a dove, but with a mahogany neck and an adjustable saddle bridge instead of the tunematic, which is really a fantastic set of specs, but only in 63. Only in 63. Yeah, look at the checking on how, yeah. how this checking has, yeah. has shown. It's amazing. And it sounds so incredibly different also. It's just a great addition to the collection. I, I, I didn't have a humming dove. And when I got the call from Elliot, I was like, I'll be right there. If Elliot calls about an acoustic, you know it's good because he's not a big fan of acoustic guitars. But yeah, yeah, if he tells you an acoustic is good, it's a good one. Oh man, killer. All right, match set. I know what this set is, but I mean, can we first start off by talking about how rad is pinstriped tweed appointments? <laughs> Especially <laughs> back in 1936. Just the case, man, it's so cool. All right, go ahead and open it up. Oh uh, yeah, that's the birth of the electric. This is the first electric guitar. Yeah. DS 150, Charlie Christian. The, the heaviest pickup of all times, but man, I got the job done. What? A, and then this is the matching companion. Yeah. That's GA the, 150 or that's whatever. The, yeah, that's the GA back in the day, being sold as a pair. The suitcase. The suitcase, because you gotta, gotta take all the back off to. Oh, look at that. <laughs> That's a set right there. It, it's cool. And this, this was a set that my dear friend Bill Goldstein from Walgreens Bill Vintage Grace. called me and he said, I just got the raddest thing <laughs> I've seen in many years. And he, when he, I. Oh, it, so you bought it as a set. You didn't, as buy, a set. The, you didn't buy the amp after no, the fact. No, no, no. As a set. And when he called me and I, I said, look, I, I don't remember where I was, if I was in London or whatever. And I said, just. Stash them, Done. put them in the vault. Yeah. I'm, I know I'm buying them, I just want to see them. And so when I came in to Walt Grace in Miami there in Wynwood, and I, I was like, are you kidding me? This is the beginning of the electric guitar. Yeah. 1936, where Charlie Christian, who was this amazing jazz player, he was, how do I amplify my sound beyond having to get closer to the microphone? Yeah. And how do, that, that he wanted to play solos. You know, Charlie wanted to be able to play fast solos and be heard. Be heard, yeah. At that point, know. it was mostly just chug, chug, rhythm stuff on the guitar right. players. It wasn't really right. single note things. And this is the birth, really, of what then becomes the P90. Yeah, this is in its most primitive form. Yeah. And even from a design standpoint, the white outline and the angles, it's just so beautiful. The, and the, pick the way the pick guards cut around it, just Look at the volume and tone knobs. Yeah, just all Art Deco. Uh, it's fucking so cool. And the amps sound great too. Does this ever get put down to drop D for tool riffs? Or do you just keep the, <laughs> yeah. You know, this yeah. Is, we should try yeah. that. <laughs> Flat wands, Flat drop, wands D. drop D. See how it goes, put, put it, it through, through the rectifier. Put it through a Badlander. <laughs> cool, man. I mean, that's... And, and wait, you gotta, because I grabbed it, you gotta feel the neck. Tell me what you feel when you grab the neck there. Ouch. <laughs> it's like a triangle. Yeah. That is like the, the, the most severe V. My God, yeah. It's, it's like crazy. an equilateral triangle. Yeah. Nuts. <laughs> but it works. It works. I mean, that's, that's Gibson history right there. That's music history right there. It is music history. That's where like guitar, guitar goes electric, man. Very, very cool. I gotta be honest, I'm a little upset. Like, I feel like you've been holding out on me. Yeah. You actually There's, haven't seen these. This is like a square and wedge shaped case with case covers on them. And I feel like I'm out of the loop here. I actually, because I thought about this at the last minute, I actually then called the guys to the customer. Let's just bring him over since, since they are the approved ones. Look at that. Oh, dude. So these are the brand new, yet to be released. These are the golden samples that I approved of the limited edition, collector's edition, 58 Corina V and Explorers. Corina. Perfect lab. 
Karina V's and Explorers are back, and their Murphy Lab. Okay. You ready? One, two, three. Oh, God, yes. Oh, it's as good as I hoped. Oh, dude, that's sick. Oh, dude, the aging came out great on these. Oh, it's so awesome. Okay. Original examples, right? Yeah. We, well, as you know, we have... We a, have a 58. A 58V in the Gibson vault. Then we got... And then we also checked a couple of other 58Vs. That Multiple we, scans. Yeah, we were able to get our hands on Vs. We were able to get our hands on Explorers. We went to Songbirds also with the scanner and scanned. Scanned stuff from their collection. And we got stuff in the custom shop. And then that led to... These are actually the golden sample approved on the run. Yeah. And Corina, African Limba, that we were able to source from Africa. These two in particular that will come with the historic case and case cover have Brazilian rosewood. Oh, Brazilian boards too. And these, is, these are the Brazilian boards that we've had now for many, many years, actually decades. So it's pre-convention Brazilian rosewood that we're able to apply and use here in the, the US. The other thing I'm looking at here, is that one piece? That's a single piece explorer. One piece, Karina body, explorer, and then center, center seam. seam. Are they all gonna be? Yeah. We're gonna do 19 explorers in 81 Vs, just, just like we shipped in 1958. Original numbers in 58. The original numbers are 19 explorers and the 81 Vs. Wow. Yeah, these are, these Here, are us. Can we trade for a second? This is nuts. amazing. The think, aging yes. is killer on it. Well, maybe this is the, the 67, when I said that's the definition of epic. Yeah. I'm confused now. <laughs> so there's 81 of these with Brazilian and 19 of those with Brazilian. We are going to do beyond this collector's edition. We are going to do Corina V. Just a price list. With the, Indian rosewood that we can ship around the world. And uh, without all the, there's case candy. You don't know, do you want to check it out? What are, yeah, what's, what goodies? Maybe we'll oh, yeah, we got, give me that. And we got swapped cases. Oh, yeah. Check that out. The original. So this is a recreation. This is of, a recreation of the of original the strap. strap with, oh, the Gibson banner? With the Gibson banner. Oh, sick. <laughs> How don't I have one? Why do I not have one of these yet? With the cable we used to ship with. The great, this is a great cable. Craft. Oh man. And the pigs. Oh, and the little tin of the two. There's nothing picks. in there yet. Oh, we don't have the certs in there yet. Yeah, with the original tin. Oh, dude. To me, the case candy is as important as the guitar. It's got to be exactly like we did it that year. That year. And everything we're putting in the case is just like we did it. Wow. Oh, dude, they even got the back, not the latches, but the hinges right. The hinges, yeah. Everything, it's, it's exactly the same. Because those hinges are totally... Oh. That's guitar nerdery right there at its finest. Even the hinges were recreated. When can people expect these? This summer. This summer? So soon. Very soon? Yeah. They're, oh, all, they're all getting done right now at the custom shop, so keep an eye because this is going to come out very, you know, pretty fast. 19 explorers aren't going aren't gonna to last. No. They're not going to last very long. <laughs> the Amazon guy here? Yeah. I, I think there's somebody wanting to get in. Let's go check it out. Check it out. It's Richie. <laughs> master, Master Scissor. What are you doing here? Mark, Lord Faulkner. I just brought your guitar <laughs> back. What are you doing here? Hey, it's not like... It's here. I know what you're doing here. What are you doing here? Oh, let me... It's oh, working. Good dude. I'm working. How you doing? Well, I'm doing very well. Doing very well. Just uh, in the area. I just thought I'd bring back... Uh, I thought I'd never see that guitar again. You almost didn't. Funny or, that you're here now because... We're looking at guitars. We're looking at guitars. Man. I knew there was something going on. I knew there was something fishy going on that you didn't invite me for. There's always a party. In fact, we were just looking at the 58s. Oh, yeah, you gotta see this. You gotta see this. Let's do it. Come on, yeah. So I didn't want to impose or anything, but I was just in the area. I didn't know, I had no idea you were oh, filming. Oh, yeah, we, we got nothing going on. What's this? 
Well, it, since you're here, I mean, you gotta see this. That's an original. That's an original. That's not an original, is it? Yeah. That's made, like a, made in 1958. No way. Their brand new custom shop historic collection, Murphy Lab, collector's edition, 58. Look at that. That's beautiful. Yeah, we got the with the cases and, with the with the proper and shape the, case as well. Well, the one that you that's also the one that you play. The 58, yeah. Yeah, the shape. Look at that, look at the checking on it and everything, that's nuts. I would do, I'll tell you what, man, you could have totally fooled me. If you said that's an original and that was an original, <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't have known. Well, we, we did them based on scans of a lot of originals, and so it's a lot of work. When it, this is basically almost like a year and a half project now coming to fruition. That's spectacular. You're seeing them just after I got to see them. Wow, man. That's, well, that's an honor. We're prioritized in the in the chain you know <laughs> well that's a total honor what's this that you brought back well this uh this i'm bring, bringing this back uh, to cesar he lent me it and this is yeah. something that i hadn't i haven't seen many of uh my predecessor used one uh kk downing uh one of my all-time favorite guitar players in the world michael Schenker used one back in the day this is, a, this is a medallion V, and I think they made these in, what, 71? Yeah, 71 and 2. 71, and it still 72. has a medallion on the case. 71 and 72, and we, I think we, we only made 350, so when this one came up for sale, I snatched it immediately. At least I bought from Elliot at Rumble Seat. Rumble Seat. Well, I wanted to get it off of you for a week or so, just to, because as I said, I haven't seen many of them. Um, so yeah, here it is. I mean, if that's not Mr. KK Downing on a Sunday morning, I don't know what is, but... Um, How did you like it? It's killer. It's killer. It's very, it's very um, acoustically vibrant uh, out of the case. And you can always tell, you know you, you, you know, you go in the store and you pick up a guitar without plugging it in. It's got a, it's loud, it's, or it's not, you know. Yeah. Uh, and this one's loud and acoustically vibrant and just a beautiful playing guitar. So uh, I recorded a couple of things with it, so. And he know. had the, we looked at the 62 SG, the one that shouldn't be. Yeah. He had that with him for a while as well. Oh yeah, the one with that fire P90s. Mm -hmm. How is the neck on this? I haven't played this one yet. It's because a lot of these are tiny. Yeah. This one is small and comfortable. <laughs> you know. Uh, but yeah, it does what it says on the tin. Um, it's beautiful condition. Yeah. Sounds great. Pickups are killer. Um, and the, the medallions match. I heard there was a, uh, you know, back in the day, people would take them off the case and put them on a, Oh, good God. What's going <laughs> on? Hey, hey guys. <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> Merry Christmas. What are you doing here? <laughs> Let me give this guy a hug. Let me set these up. Hold up, buddy. What's up, Colo? Oh, great. Oh, my God. How did you get Welcome my room to, to your house? What were these that you just brought back? Might as well look at these. These were the guitars that uh, we uh, were using on, on The Sick, The Dying, and The Dead, our new album. And... Um, Let's oh see. wow! Holy cow! Yes. Vine. This is the one we used uh, the most. Yeah. Um, this is the the, the songwriter. Songwriter, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, boy, this thing sounded absolutely perfect for what we were trying to do. And um, we we a B'd a bunch of different acoustics that we had, and it was really hard to to uh, narrow it down. Um, but towards the very end, it became clear that this was, this was a monster guitar. Yeah, I was in the studio with Dave a couple of weeks ago, and Rake Straw, the producer, said, hey, we're looking for a different sound, and I will try the Songwriter and the J45. I think you were, you were using a Hummingbird. Yeah, yeah, that and, and the prototype acoustic that we're working and your, on. And so. your prototype. So right. we said, hey, you know, try something different. So. Thank you for bringing them back. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. Thank you for letting me have them. Does he charge you a fee? Because he charges me a fee. Did he? Yeah. How much? 20 bucks a day. Really? Yeah. I'd like to knock him down from 30 bucks a day as well. You still did. <laughs> we have to talk about your obsession with silver burst guitars. When, when did that happen? And what is driving your obsession with cornering the market on silver burst right now? It started with the Brendan Small Thunder Horse. Thunder Horse, yeah. And when that guitar came out, I immediately bought it. It just looked cool. It was, the, to me, like my first experience with a Silver Burst. Yeah. And I bought that Explorer, and I actually put the Tony Iommi pickups in it. 
as we talked about earlier, yeah. I was always moving things around yeah. and opening. So I put the Tony Iommi pickups in it and that quickly became one of my favorite guitars. And that's when I started then looking at, okay, what else is out there silver burst? And so I bought a couple of Les Pauls. And then I started now working with Adam. And now is, you just got to one up Adam Jones every Adam, time you get. <laughs> Adam is Mr. Silverburst, right? I mean, you think of Adam Jones and you think Silverburst. Custom, or you yeah. say Silverburst and you immediately think of Adam. And so Adam and I started talking a lot about it. And every time we will send each other links when things come up. Yeah. It's like, do you want it? Because I'm going to get it. Or like, we always check with each other and, and we go out and buy them. We got a lot of V's. We're, yeah. I've never seen a Silver Burst V with no. a black guard. With a black guard and looking like that from, that's 82. It's so totally it's really, unfaded. It hasn't greened out. Because the first one you see there is a 79. Okay, so this is 79 V. And that's normally what they look like now. Dang They've enough. yellowed out. Piss Burst, we call them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can say that. Wow. And, and this one, someone had done a, probably like a string through, so there's a repair oh, there. Now that one, Mark, is 81. And that's gone kind of green too. Yeah, so that's also greened and yellowed out. It's crazy, the bumper on these, how high yeah. the uh, fingerboard sits above the body. Wow, true that. It's like, it's huge. Yeah, it goes from quite a thick Check out section the, check out the, the, the here. volute on this one. It's Volute's the biggest enormous. volute I've ever seen. But this thing looks like yeah. a good golf grip right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is they, the cleanest silver burst. That's massive. I've, and and see, that's got that headstock. That's kind of like. That's tiny. Yeah. That is very tiny and round. What's that, in the early 80s? This is what, 80, 82? 82. Oh, with the original, uh, what do you call those, Mark, on the, on the, the, the strap buttons? The diamond strap. The diamond strap button. Check that one out. But what oh, happens? With the black. With the black uh, well, it's Black Garden. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Killer. Yeah. That headstock looks so alien. Yeah, to yeah, round it out. Yeah. You've got yeah. you. Hey, two, two flying V bases. You have to, right? Why not? <laughs> um, <laughs> Let me grab one of these. That one, well, one is, a, I don't remember which one is which, but one is a 79 and this the other is an one 81. is an 81. Okay, so that, this one is 79. Oh, man. It's funny, it says V-Base on the cover. It's like I, had, I would have had no idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. everyone could have told. So he, had, he played one of these, right? He, played yeah, the, he also the... played a V. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to do it in the future, in the future Gene T-Squared collection. We're going to do a V. Don't, don't start asking when. It's out in the future. <laughs> Van Halen. Yeah, right. He played that, right? Did, Did you he? hear that? Yeah, no, the no. opening riff for Running With The Devil, he played that. What's, that's the one that kind of started it all down there? Yep. This is the one. That's the one I told you earlier or when we were doing the interview. It's the first silver burst I got. And you said you changed the pickups on this. Right. It's the Thunder Horse that was the Brendan Small yeah. model. And then I put the Tony Iommi pickups in it. Very cool. So one Explorer, three Vs, three. two V bases. Boy, this is heavy. Yeah. How many Les Pauls? Les Pauls? I don't know. First off, I'm looking here. They're also not all, not all here. <laughs> Thunder Horse. Here's the Adam Jones. And for anybody out there wondering who got serial number seven of the Adam Jones run, it's you. What do you expect? Yeah. I'm they, sure that was a serial write, number. They write lot. everything in a seven What's time it? signature. Adam I don't know much about the oh, silver burst. Like, right, right, right. What was the, when did they first start making them? I have no 78. idea. 78. 78. It was the first year you start seeing silver burst, and then it kind of runs through the mid-80s, yeah. 86, maybe, 85, 86. I don't know, 86, 85, yes. 85. But they tend to, for whatever reason, be significantly heavier than anything else. I don't know if it's, it's something heavy metal. in the paint it's heavy metal. that is making them way more, hmm. but they do, but they have a tone, man. And it's, it. it's killer. Let me put this back up. Let's have a it's Silver Burst Les Paul party. I mean, look at that. Yeah, man. Oh, I almost let go. <laughs> <laughs> so what is this? Oh, it is heavy. That's a 79. This is a 79, but you obviously I uncovered, the uncovered it. And look at that, that's like on gold. Yeah. There's another 82. Wow. 
all, I mean, yeah, and bridge all, pickup covers are totally under uh, overrated. And all on drop D. Yeah, they're all. <laughs> this is crazy. And this one. And look at the silver here, Mark. Maple next too, right? Oh yeah, like it that looks like too. silver sharpie, and then you see over here, and it's like gold. And the one you're yeah. holding as well. Oh wow! And that's a 1980. This is an 80. They're all so maple the, necks, right? For the, the silver. At this silver. era, yeah. Yeah, maple yeah that's necks. awesome. Which I think sounds better. I don't know about you. It gives it a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a bite. I find maple neck. This the is maple neck. Yeah. An official. Wait, wait a Wow. <laughs> oh no! That's the one you're not supposed to grab. Hey, it's on camera. It's all good. What was uh, what's the big deal about this? What? That's the USA version it's as just opposed a to the yeah prototype. Because mm -hmm. they they're not, that's a standard, mm -hmm. and the silver bursts <coughs> were always in oh, the, the custom custom shop. Cust the custom, custom ah, point of gotcha. yeah. custom I understand. Show. How many more? Do I, you intend on? Well, no, buying? I have <laughs> I have four or five more that are in storage. I actually have another V silver burst in storage. There's more V's in storage anyway, beyond just silver bursts. Yeah. I think there's five or five more silver burst Les Paul customs that I have in storage. What do you think of this whole guitar collection that your dad's put together? Um, I think he has a lot of guitars, and I don't ever play the guitar because I don't play it yet. But I play piano to get the guitar started. If we were going to start playing guitar. Would you want to start on a Gibson? Would you want to start on an Epiphone? Or would you want a Kramer? Which one is kind of up your alley? Gibson. You want a Gibson? Is there a certain model that you like? Are you a Flying V guy or a Les Paul guy? The Adam Jones guitar. Excellent choice. The Adam Jones Silver Burst? Yes. Kid's got good taste. This looks like a newer case. Newer case, a little smaller. Yeah. It's a prototype. Back to prototypes. It, and freaking silver burst again. This is Dave's? Yeah. How rad is this? Silver burst acoustic with 24 frets. 24 frets. Freaking Vic rattlehead on the pick guard. Vic rattlehead on the, on the headstock. headstock. Yeah. I'm yeah. in. I'm in. Look at that. Look at so, that silver burst. This is the prototype of Dave's. So this is basically what, a CF100. CF100 body with the CF100 cutaway, slightly altered bracing, opened up a little bit because of the scale and because of the fretboard coming in, uh, which actually we found out makes the sound nicely yeah, balanced. And so that worked out. really well. So yeah, showing you this prototype, but this prototype we're not gonna put into production. It's, uh, it's, we, these were ideas that we were exploring with, uh, maybe for a future limited run. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this is the, the silver burst one. We, are, we, we explored with the black one, with the blood burst, yeah. natural finish. We're actually now exploring the songwriter bigger body also yeah. to see how he likes it. Like he used Said my, he used that on the record my songwriter yeah. on the record. He loved it. So I told him, hey, why don't we make you a bunch of prototypes with that body too and see how you like it with, with the 24 frets. Yeah. So that's what we're working on right now. But if there's a silver burst one, I mean, you should. If not you, then who? Who? Then who? Yeah. yeah here you go. Bolivian number two. I'm a get, I, I, I probably can guess who has number, number, one. number one. Yeah, you, you probably can <laughs> guess who's got number one. Yeah, so we made a couple of these prototypes way before we did the Slash collection. And, and these actually we made out of the custom shop. And so we sent him a couple and... Killer. Yep, Kept yeah, number right two. Do the dance. Yeah, that's the first top. dance. Yeah. 58 spec. Oh yeah, it is. Holy cow. Third million burst. It's a, su a substantial neck. Yep. Comfortable though. Beautiful. Well, that sticker, sticker kind of says it all. This is the, oh yeah, signed by Tony. Yeah. What do we got here? Yeah, this is the prototype, the final approved of that run we did of 50 of Iomi signature custom shop aged replicas of his original guitar, the one that he used to write pretty much. I think all the way through to the fourth record or first so. First four albums, yeah. First four albums of Black Sabbath are this guitar. And it was interesting. This guitar 
everybody knows that I'm, uh, I love Black Sabbath and that's the reason why I play guitar. And so one day I got called into a custom shop and the, everybody was huddled in there in the, uh, in the huddle room. And I walk in and what's going on? I thought like, oh, you know, something's wrong and we're going to miss production or something. Yeah. And, and no, they wanted to present me with this guitar. Like everybody in the custom shop got together and they said, we want to present this guitar to you because we know that this is, you know, Tony is the reason you play guitar and this is the final, the final approved Tony Iommi and we want you to have it. So like a lacquer on the fingerboard. Yeah. So he did that, I'm poly, guessing, yeah. to create more friction, I guess. On the, on to create the... more height so it wouldn't catch on the... The thimbles. You know, he's right. got the leather caps on the yeah. fingertips, and so he did that in order to be able to slide his fingers up and down the fretboard. He thought it would make it easier. So, yeah. How did you get this? Was that like a... He put that sticker on his original guitar. How did you get the... And so we basically did a scan of it, ah. um, and, and then recreated it. We actually found the original whatever the artist that has credit to, to it, yeah. and uh, we got the approval to use it. We can. And you got, you got a chance that day when we were filming with all the, these guitars made, and we were talking to Tony, you got a chance to interview Tony. Yes, asked him some you know, questions. We've got some really insightful uh, answers. And he was very much like, people ask me all the time, like, how was it, was it nerve wracking? And it's like, no, he was like the most, he made everyone feel so comfortable. Totally. I wasn't nervous at all, you know what I mean? I thought I was going to be, because it's Tony Homie. But it um, made everyone feel comfortable. It was very much like two buddies having a conversation about guitar. It was, a, it was a, an honor, really, to do that. So, yeah, thanks, guys. Awesome. All right, we got a burst here. What's significant about this well, one? Well, this is ground zero of the Murphy Lab. This is where prototype, basically prototype zero of Final. It predates process. prototype one. Yeah. Final <laughs> oh, process approved. Like, it's just X. That's wicked. X, 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 X. That's brilliant. Of the Murphy Lab. This is the first one that we said heavy aged Murphy Lab treatment and process done by Tom in the lab. And that's the one. I've gotten three of these now since the Murphy Lab has launched, and they're just my favorite guitars that I have now. They're so good, they feel so great. The necks, that binding roll is just so broken in. Ridiculous. And that's the way it should be, right? I mean, if you do a blindfolded test and you feel the guitar without seeing it, it's gotta feel right, it's gotta feel like a 60-year-old guitar. Dude, thank you for having us out, man. That was so much fun. I feel like we only saw like a, little a fraction. fraction of the collection, but we saw like we saw some epic stuff, though. We saw some cool things. That was amazing. Thank you so much. Hey, my pleasure. For having us out, man. It was a pleasure. Hey, I'm Mark Agnesi for Gibson TV. I'll see you guys again next time on the next episode of The Collection.